Hi there, and welcome to a couple miles up the mountain of the Hay Estate. We are currently sitting in a forest that, if you can believe, just about 300 years ago was actually pasture land. Now, not all of you have forestry backgrounds, but I want to take you through a couple of the clues that let us know that this was an active farm uh, about 300 years ago. First, as you can probably see behind me, we have this stone wall. These stone walls were built with the glacial till that was actually pulled from the soil and then used to demark the boundaries for different farms. Next behind me, you'll see a mix of trees such as spruce, uh, such as... Next behind me, you'll see trees. Next behind me, you'll see trees that are a mix of different pioneer species. Pioneer species are trees that love light and grow really fast. This means that our trees are highly, are dense areas of birch and also include different areas of different types of conifers that like to grow really quickly. Another thing you'll notice is that the trees are all relatively similar sized in diameter. This means that they all started growing at around the same time and there hasn't been sufficient time for larger trees to really um, initiate themselves into the environment. We also see an active understory at play. So small trees like this actually mark that there's a lot of light coming through the canopy. As this reaches climax forest, we're gonna see that light really decrease and the understory is gonna stop being so active and productive. Now we're sitting here in modern day Newbury. However, it used to be called Fisher Field. The first land grant actually occurred in 1753. So only one farm in this area that was active in the 1700s is still active today. We think of this as a really special case because it occurred in a very fertile valley that has very good protection from the weather. None of the other farms from that era are active today. Now we don't have a lot of documentation about the farms that specifically existed on this land. However, in the 1980s, as part of a community project, um, somebody put together a really comprehensive history of the land a few miles down the road at Mount Sunapee State Park. There we have a really cool documentation of one of the local farmers who was one of the first farmers on this land. Something I want to draw your attention to is that as part of this document, the grandchildren of that original farmer were all interviewed and their experiences and memories of their grandfather were in part used to reconstruct the data and the story of that farm. So we see that between 1823 and 1829, a Quaker named Abijah Johnson buys a land parcel in Newbury, New Hampshire. He decides he's gonna turn this into a farmland. He picks this space specifically because it is protected from the weather, has good soil, and will be appropriate for farmland. Um, he then does a lot of land clearing. So he clear cuts all the trees, he pulls out a lot of the glacial till, and then he prepares the land as pastures for sheep for sheep, cattle, horses, and then to grow his corn and potatoes and hay. Now this farm continues quite successfully as a farm. And then in addition, it opens a hotel from 1867 to 1868. He calls this hotel the Sunapee Mountain House. Now I wanna read you a little quote about the Sunapee Mountain House. It goes, the area around the lake was fast becoming a popular summer resort and not the least popular of the hotels was the Sunapee Mountain Resort, which stood, 600 feet above the surface of Lake Sunapee and commanded a fine view of the lake and surrounding mountains. So the hotel actually burns down in 1876, but the family continues to take borders for about the next 30 years. We see that immediately after the Johnson family leaves that parcel of land, logging companies move in and start clear cutting the forest in, from about 1906 to 1910. Remember that, because we're gonna come back and talk about the impacts of the logging industry on tourism soon. So the Johnson family is not really a special case because a lot of families in the late 1800s saw their family farms start to have start to default on taxes and start to be not as economically productive as they had once hoped. So we see a mass exodus from the farms. There are a couple reasons that people think of why there was this, such a big exodus from the farms. This includes manufacturing, the presence of railroads, the pull of the Midwest and urbanization. Um, but it's hard to know for sure. But a big emphasis here is that it was a social phenomena. It didn't have to do with the infertility of the soil. Something else that's really interesting is the state of New Hampshire noticed this and they saw that the farms were failing and a lot of them were defaulting on their taxes. Now the state of New Hampshire thought of a couple different ways to stabilize agriculture and support it in the state. However, they also had a new idea which is to increase tourism to this region. So they saw the opportunity in rich, wealthy, rich, wealthy and social elites to bring their summer homes and summer estates up here. 
So that includes the building of the trains and the grand hotels that brought affluent city dwellers up to this area. Now, John Hay was one of those wealthy elites and he actually purchases his first piece of land in 1888. He starts with the Rowe Farm, but over the years he buys seven different farms, amasses the land to form a thousand acre estate that includes a lot of lake shoreline and then going all the way up to Sunset Hill. And that's a lot of what the land is protected today. 